Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than any two edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes, all scripture is in fact God breathed and it's profitable for what for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be mature thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed thought to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. You understand that. And if perhaps you do not understand rebound and operation cry, please text me, ask me what, what it means. I want to explain it to you because it's absolutely imperative that you do this before every Bible study, okay? Now, with that in mind, we're going to prepare ourselves for uh, the Word of God by rebound in just a moment. But our subject today is Philippians chapter 2, part 8, and we're going to continue with verse 3. I think we'll finish verse 3 today. This will be three sessions on this one verse, but it's absolutely been filled with information that teaches us about the Christian way of life. So with that in mind, your head bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out our prayer time, make a few announcements, and then pick up with our Bible study this morning. You make your own way with the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of studying your word again. My, oh, my. It's been Wednesday, last Bible study, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's almost been four days since the last Bible study. But we're not restricted uh, to do nothing. We're not, it, it's not required for us to do nothing between Bible studies because we have all kinds of opportunities for us to reread the notes, think about it, ask questions, get answers. The Christian way of life is a vital part of our everyday living, Father. And without a, without a knowledge of the Christian way of life and the angelic conflict, life is actually worthless to us. So we want to make the most out of your plan for our lives. In order to do that, we must understand your word. So with that in mind, Father, we're going to turn this over to you and ask for those who are online with us on WebEx and Facebook and eventually on YouTube to give undivided attention to the teaching of the Word of God so that in the sphere of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will have an opportunity to illuminate our mind, to teach us the meaning of your Word as, and as the Word that comes out of my mouth. I'm a teacher, Father, but I, uh, I'm not the one who actually illuminates the mind. I give the information. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. So there must be a, a function in, in the Christian life, like functioning in the sphere of the Spirit, that enables the Holy Spirit to give us the information we need and to teach us the meaning. So with that in mind, Father, we turn this over to you and ask uh, that you guide us uh, graciously and mercifully in all that we do and say in Christ's name. Amen. Now, before we begin our, our Bible study, I've got several things I want to say, and I've got my phone over here. Uh, that's uh, set on uh, 45 minutes to turn this tape over. So you'll hear the, the phone buzz about 40, 40 minutes and 45 seconds from now telling me to turn this tape over. Uh, the tape is being used for other people who don't have access to the Word of God except through that means. Now, let me just say this. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a spiritual way of life. Well, what is religion? Religion is man by man's effort that you, that's me, that's us, black, white, rich, poor, makes no difference. If you're a human being, religion is you or somebody else trying to gain the approval of God through their own self effort. It won't work. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a spiritual way of life, which means that God the Father has made the plan He's given the plan to us. He's given us all the resources that we need to live out his plan in our life. 
And that's what makes it a spiritual way of life because it depends on our faith, not our works. It is belief in the Lord Jesus Christ that begins this spiritual uh, spiritual journey. So religion is not a, a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's a spiritual way of life. And I want to throw something else in here that at this point in time, our beloved friend, uh, Richard Clark uh, was at, uh, went to the hospital this morning, emergency room, about 4.30 in the morning, and uh, he's been diagnosed with kidney stones on both in both kidneys. So uh, I would encourage you to pray for him at this point in time uh, that he might uh, get the relief that he actually needs and uh, God's guidance in this matter. So we're going to pray for Richard. Um, another thing that we want to mention is Let's see, uh, the sobering realization that our Bible study this morning is giving us a good understanding of what the Christian way of life is. Again, it's not a, it's not a, a matter of religion. It's a spiritual way of life. And as a result of uh, our, our failure, and when I say our failure, that's editorializing, meaning the general public, the general uh, body of believers in the United States and across the world, they, we just don't understand what the Christian way of life is all about. It's it's reduced. It's been reduced to a religion. Oh, you go to Sunday school. You carry your Bible. You sing in the choir. You help somebody across the street. You you give your you give your money, whatever. But all that's done in the energy of the flesh. Just following the rules and the guidelines of Christianity. That's not a transformed life. So what I want us to understand at this point in time, as we turn to our notes, that again, Christianity is not a religion. And what we're going to see this morning as we turn to our notes is that the Christian way of life is a sobering, a sobering way of life. It's a precisely correct procedure. Now, I've indicated to you on numerous occasions that the, the body of Christ today is failing and is failing in the area of understanding the doctrine is the most important thing in our life if we're going to live the Christian way of life. You can't live the Christian way of life without Bible doctrine. And I have something in my hand here today that I'm going to read to you because many of you, many of you realize that I've been talking to you and telling you from a scriptural viewpoint, from a biblical worldview, that the, the, the world is in, in deep trouble. Humanity is in deep trouble. And I've indicated to you that in the United States of America as a nation is just this side of becoming other than what it was designed to be based on the Old and New Testaments, based upon the Word of God, allowing the people of the United States the freedom we need to study the Word of God, the freedom to evangelize, the freedom to send out missionaries all over the world, and actually in the Old Testament, the Jews failed at that, so God drove them out of the land in 70 AD for the third time. They've not, not gone back in yet and won't until they won't be there legitimately until the second coming of Christ. We're headed for the tribulation. I don't know when it's going to happen, but we're headed there for sure. And Dr. W. O. Vaught, many years ago, possibly as much as 40 to 50 years ago, made a comment in his notes as he was teaching doctrine to his congregation at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And the, ama the, the, the statement that he made, made is absolutely amazing. It's interesting to note that a man of his caliber and of his stature would, be, would actually make a statement like this but the statement he made actually was an indication that he was willing to stand for truth without regard to the consequence. Remember, the Dr. Vaught was the man who actually pointed me in the direction of doctrine. Dr. Doc, Dr. Vaught pointed me in 1973. You can calculate how long ago that's been. 
1973, he pointed me to doctrine. He pointed me to R.B. Theme, who was going to show me the way to study the Word of God to be a great or good pastor teacher, teaching isogogy categorically and exegetically. Well, somewhere between 40 and 50 years ago, Dr. Bott, in one of his messages, made this statement. I'm going to read it. And it was it was made based on, I believe he was studying and exegeting, expositing the book of James. And he says, so the question is simply this. And I raised that same question. So the question is simply this. Are you, starting with Jim Bertel at the top, going all the way down to the bottom of the list, those of us that are Christians, are you willing to know from taking in doctrine every day? Are you willing to know? Remember, um, our passage of scripture indicates knowing this, knowing this. And what is it we're to know? The word know there, or the knowing this, this is actually doctrine, knowing this. And Dr. Bott asked, are you willing to know from taking in doctrine every way, every day. So by taking in doctrine every day, you know what the facts are. You know and have a biblical worldview, so you understand what's going on out here, and you can explain contemporary history. So he said, the, the question is really this. Are you willing to know from taking in doctrine every day? He said, somewhere along the line, your faith, must come to have a working object. Now, what does that mean? Your faith has to come to have a working object. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Oh, yes, you mean you're one of those faithers? Oh, you you are you, you're living by faith? Well, most often, faith has no object. If you're going to have faith, you must have faith in something. You must have faith in a uh, in a, a doctrinal principle, you have faith you're believing something out there. Well, if you're going to be a born-again Christian, your faith is in Jesus Christ. The moment you have faith in Christ, you become a born-again Christian, you have eternal life. But then after you become a born-again Christian, you must live the Christian way of life. If we claim to be Christians, we ought to live as Christians should live. And how do you live? You live by faith. And the evidence of your faith is the work that you do. So Dr. Bott says, somewhere along the line, your faith as a born-again Christian, this is phase two now, your faith must have a working object or you will continue to be operationally dead. Now, that phrase operationally dead, and, and coming up very soon, we're going to talk about the eight different kinds of death. Because as we grow, we're going to learn vocabulary. We're going to, we're going to develop categories of doctrine out of the, voca the vocabulary that we take in. So the question is this, are you, are you willing to take in the word of God and be operationally productive, or are you willing to be operationally dead? And what that means is living the Christian way of life, everything that you do is coming from operational death, meaning that everything that you do for God is worth nothing because you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing in the wrong way. So Dr. Pott says somewhere along the line, your faith must come to have a working object or you will continue to be operationally dead. He says, continually be operationally dead. Then he quotes, he says, oh, vain man, oh, vain man. And he says that phrase, oh, main, uh, uh, vain man, is a vocabulary masculine singular from kinos and tropos. And it means empty, fruitless, void, without truth, empty of doctrine. That's what that word vain means. So here it is, we have a believer who is a vain believer because they're empty of doctrine, they're fruitless in everything they do, they're void, they have nothing, they're without truth, they're empty of doctrine. And he goes on to say, this believer, that, em that um, operationally dead believer, that believer who is saved, yes, he's saved, that makes him a believer, whether it's a he or she, but their, their production is absolutely worthless. So he said, this believer re refers to uh, this believer refers to the believer who never grew up. Listen, are you, are you listening to me? Because I've got a statement about that later on. And it just so happened that when this was passed on to me last night, and when I heard about it, I said, I've got to have that. 
because I wanted to I wanted to share this with you today because here's a man who 40 to 50 years ago was telling you the same thing I'm telling you today and I'm not doing this to say oh look how good I am I'm just wanting to understand there are other people who believe the same thing about how horrible this world is today and the swamp that we're living in I call it the septic tank then he goes on to say the believer refers here to the believer who never grew up never took in doctrine and then parenthetically, he makes this statement, which is an absolute fantastic statement. He said, I dedicate this statement, I dedicate this lesson, I dedicate this understanding that so many of us out here are trying to live the Christian way of life, but they're living it as operationally dead people. And he said, I dedicate this to Southern Baptists, for we have so many millions of exactly this type. This is why I left the Southern Baptist Convention in 1975. Two years into taking in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, anywhere from 10 to 20 hours a day, when I finally found out what the answer was, studying four inch, four inch reel tapes. Then it went, uh, for, first of all, it was the just the cassette tapes like I have going on right here. I first started listening to Bob Thiem using cassette tapes. Then I went to the four uh, went to the to the four inch reel tape. Then I moved to the seven inch reel tape, and the seven inch reel tape on both sides. So actually, there were four lessons on a seven out inch reel tape. I was listening to this information, studying it, writing it down, handwriting it, anywhere from ten to twenty hours a day. You see, twenty hours a day. Just ask, just ask if that is not true. Well, I'll just, I'll, I won't go any further than that. So Dr. Vaught says, I dedicate this study to Southern Baptists, for we have so many millions of exactly this type, and operationally dead believers who are failing to take in doctrine, religious, but not spiritual. Then he says, a believer must be filled with doctrine. Oh, hold on. A, a believer must be filled with doctrinal truth if he is going to be a producer. And the producer means you're actually producing fruit out here that's something other than human good. Because at the Bema seat, everything you do as a born-again Christian, every opportunity that you have is going to be measured by Jesus Christ one-on-one -on -one at the Bema seat, and all of this good will be thrown into the fire, and the, the final determination will be how many rewards Jesus is going to distribute to you. You have a basket full. This is, an, this is just an illustration. You have a basket full of rewards that God the Father has given to Jesus to distribute to you at the Bema seat. But the truth of the matter is, is everything you do in life will be measured after you're born again. Everything you do in life will be measured as to whether or not it's human good or divine good. And the determination will be how many rewards you get at the Bema seat. And if in fact you are only religious as a Christian, you will get nothing at the Bema seat. And that basket of, of uh, rewards will be placed over here so that throughout all of eternity, when you pass that basket, you'll see what could have been yours, but will never be yours because you failed in your Christian way of life. He said a believer must be filled with the truth if he is going to be a producer. That which is produced in our life, in your life, apart from doctrine, is the sum total of zero. Let me tell you what that says again. He said that which is produced, so the, you're looking out here at all you've done out here for Jesus, that which is produced in your life apart from doctrine is the sum total of zero. He capitalized the word zero and he underlined it. Then he went on and said, it may impress men what you do out here, this human good out here, all these things you're doing. He said, it may impress men and it may even produce impressive statistics like, oh, ho, oh, I've baptized 45 people. I've got 786 people in Sunday school every Sunday. We've got 45 people singing in the choir, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and we, by the way, we give millions of dollars to, to God on an annual basis. He said, it may impress men and it may even produce impressive statistics, but it doesn't impress God, period, over and out. Now, with that in mind, Dr. Botts notes, I also want to throw in something that uh, Al Rosenblum and I were talking this past, past week, and Al's message 
and his ministry right now basically is marriage counseling. And he's taught, we, we were talking about marriage, and Al made the comment that oftentimes, without the, he not t- he's not telling me who he's, who he's counseling with. He's not telling me what their problems are. He made, a, he made a statement that lines up with the word of God. He said, many people believe that marriage, when you, when you enter into marriage, everything is going to be, oh, just, you're going to get the rosy glow. It's going to be so wonderful out there. All this pain and suffering that you had before you got married, all that's going to go away. And so somebody comes to you and says, excuse me, uh, I've got a marriage problem. Well, what's your problem? Now, again, I'm not disclosing information. I'm not giving you people's names. I know this to be true. He's simply confirming it. So what he said was this. He said, uh, the the husband will come to him and say, well, you know, uh, Mr. Al, he said, if just my wife would do what I'm asking her to do, he said, our marriage would be so much better. Or the wife may come to the to uh, to Al and say, "Oh, Al, my marriage would be so much better if my husband would just do what I'm asking him to do." And he says, "Look, we have to understand something." He said, "We have to understand why God designed marriage. One of the things that God designed marriage to do was to be a test, T E S T, a test to you and me." as to whether or not we're going to use God's grace provisions to pass these tests so that we can become stronger spiritually, moving on to in spiritual maturity, to greater, to greater objectives, moving from spiritual self-esteem to spiritual autonomy, to maximum spiritual maturity, so that we can undergo evidence testing at, at, on the witness stand with Satan testing us at that point in time. So marriage, Al says, marriage is a test. Well, I've been I've been talking about the tests that we get. The tests that God brings to your life are designed for your good. Oh my goodness, I'm under pressure again. Oh Lord, I wish you'd take all this stuff away. Paul, God says, look, just like Paul, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna take it away. You're gonna to learn to handle this or you're gonna be defeated. So you either learn to handle these tests or you don't. So what, what how say marriage is a test. You say, yeah, I guess it is. But it's a test designed to strengthen you in your Christian way of life. Now, with that, with that in mind, let's go back now. To, let's get to our passage of scripture. Because the truth of the matter is, here again, is the sobering understanding of what Christianity is really all about. In verse three, I have one final point, two lessons on this so far. We're down to the end of the verse, and here's one final part, point. The verse actually says, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Now stop there. But with humility, and we've indicated in our previous lesson that humility is the humble mind, humble mindedness. It's the, it's the willingness to see see yourself as something other than what it re- what you really think it is. It's not, uh, it's not arrogant pride, but it's a humbleness of mind that's actually looking at yourself in an, ex- in a diff- an entirely different way, looking at you as God would want you to see yourself. So he says, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourself. So what that means is, I'm going to take a look out here. I'm going to see who you are. I'm going to see what you are. I'm going to be uh, be hearing you. I'm going to be seeing you. I'm going to be doing things with you. And there may be people you hear about that you have no knowledge about. You're just hearing something about these people. But no matter who these people are out here, you and I are to look at other people and see them, consider them as more important than ourselves. Question, question. Did you hear that? Stop and look at your life. Look out this way. Look at your look at your family. Look at your neighbors. Look at the people you work with. How are you envisioning those people? Uh, anybody in the home? Anybody on the job? Anybody on the street? Anybody that you uh, you fellowship with? Go to lunch with? What is it? Consider the people that you are. You're, you're dealing with, you're running with, you're, uh, you know, you have, um, you have a relationship with. 
but with humility, consider those people individually more important than yourselves. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? This is what Christianity is all about. Not carrying your Bible, not going to Sunday school class, singing the choir, or whatever else. And here's a Christian rule, and the Christian rule is this. The Christian rule, a rule for you and me, to consider another believer as more important than yourself. What that means is I have to consider Andy and Valerie from Temecula, California, more important than me. I've got to consider Angie Black more important than me. I've got to consider Bob and Wilma more important than me. I've got to consider Leanne and Brian, my children, more important than me. Steve and Annette, Dale May, da Danny and Carolyn, Dennis and Dawn, my wife, Janet, Kat and Ron. I have to consider you, Joe Hurley and others that are on, on Facebook right now. I have to consider you more important than me. That's humility. When my attitude is exactly that, my, my attitude is one of humility. So here's the rule to consider another believer as more important than yourself. Now, let me point out something here. It's very possible that we could just close right here because if we give, if we add any more information, it's very likely that this rule will, be, will get covered up and smothered by this additional information. So that because this is so sobering, such an important principle, maybe we ought to just quit right here. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go on. Let's talk about that rule for just a moment. This rule will not make you blind. And I've got that word you in red. I don't know how it shows up on, on your phone or your iPad or your computer. But it's in red because I left that word out. So this rule will not make you blind to the defects of others when their defects are openly manifested. Now, in other words, you, you, you see them. You're looking at your wife, you're looking at your husband, you're looking at your children, you look at your boss, you look at your neighbor, you look at your friends, whoever they are. And as you observe them, it's very possible that they will have defects in their life and you will observe those defects. And because the rule is to consider another person, another believer as more important than yourself, does not mean that you're going to be blind to their defects, especially when you observe them. There were many things, there were many things that disqualified an Israelite from entering into the Holy of Holies. Now hold on for me just a moment. We're going to give, we're going to have here a an, anal, an analogy. And the analogy is between spiritual defects that may be in your life and my life, spiritual defects in your life and my life as members of the body of Christ. And we're going to compare that analogously to the physical defects of the Israelites, spiritual defects, analogous to physical defects. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some physical defects of people in Israel, the Israelites functioning on the Mosaic law. And when we learn something about what God said about those physical defects, we may learn something and should learn something about our own spiritual defects. So in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 16, here's what the Lord said. He said, the Lord commanded Moses. What did he say to Moses? He said, you go tell Aaron, the high priest. He said, you go tell Aaron, none of your descendants. Aaron, none of your descendants who has any physical defect. He said, any physical defect. That's not a few. That's not a whole lot. That's not 99 of 100. Any physical defect, those person." None of your descendants who has any physical defect may present the food offering to me. Now, what that means is to do that, you have to move into you're, you're functioning in the uh, in the uh, the area of the temple. And he said, you can't do this. You if you have a physical defect, can you imagine that? Just just take a look around. Look at your own life. Look at the life of your, the people, you know. If there is any physical defect as a Jew back in that point in time, they would not be able to present the food offering to God. And this applies for all time to come. That is in the age of Israel. So throughout the entire age of Israel, if you had a, if you had a, a defect, 
physical defect, you could not take the food offering and present it to God. Verse 18 says, no man, that means male and female, that's human being, Jew, Israelite, no man with any physical defect may make the offering. No one who is blind, now watch this, blind, lame, defigured, disfigured, or deformed. Now listen to that. No man, no human being, no Jew with any physical defect may make the offering. Can't make the food offering. No one who is blind, lame, figured, disfigured, or deformed. No one who is with a crippled hand or foot. Verse 21, no one who is a hunchback or a dwarf. No one with any eye or skin disease. And no eunuch. He goes on. That's not the end of the list. No descendant of Aaron, the priest, who has any physical defects, may, may present the food offering to me. Verse 22. So what can man do? If you have a physical defect, you can't make this offering to God. Such a man may eat the food offered to me, both the holy, the holy food offering and the very holy food but not just both the holy food offering and the very holy food offering. But because he has a physical defect, he shall not come near the sacred curtain or approach the altar where the sacrifice, where the, where the offering would be made. And then he goes on to say, he must not profane these holy things because I am the Lord and I make them holy. You hear all that? So the man, you, you can't enter the Holy of Holies. You can't present these things to the Lord simply because you have a physical defect. Now, that's God. That's not Moses. That's not Aaron. God had a reason for doing this. Then I want to ask us to do this. If this were true about physical defects, what about spiritual defects in our own life? What about spiritual defects? that limit Christian access to the Holy of Holies. I've got quotes around that. And our Holy of Holies, I'm gonna say, is an analogous to the sphere of the spirit, which is the green circle. You see, as a born again Christian, we need to be living our Christian way of life in the sphere of the spirit. And the only way you can get there after salvation and you lose the sphere of the spirit because you committed a sin, then the necessity is get back in the sphere of the spirit. And until you learn how through Bible doctrine to get back in the sphere of the spirit, everything you do is human good and will burn at the Bema seat. And no, how, no, no matter how much doctrine you think you have, you're not, a, you're not an experientially spiritual people because you're missing the boat in terms of God's plan for your life. So what I want us to do is look at the physical defects of the Israelites and what they couldn't do and indicate and and draw an analogy between that and the spiritual defects in our lives that are going to act going to act um, limit our access Christian access to the holy of holies which is the sphere the sphere of the spirit the green circle here are some of our spiritual defects consistent with some of the defects that are up above here in our Leviticus passage. First of all, he said, if you were blind, if you were lame, and he goes down through there and says, here is the defect. Well, here's, here's the analogy to the defects of the Jews. They were blind physically. We are spiritually blind. That's a defect in our life. Spiritually blind, what does that mean? You lack vision. You lack vision for your, what the purpose of your Christian way of life. You don't see the future. You don't see what the Christian way of life is really all about. Why? You lack vision because you are spiritually blind, spiritually lame. This is the, this is the born again Christian who's stumbling through the Christian way of life. In the sphere of the spirit, out of the sphere of the spirit, back in, rebound here, rebound there, thinking rebound's going to make you spiritual, and it doesn't. It's rebound plus operation cry. So you're here you are, you're, you're rebounding, you're rebounding, not you necessarily, but you rebound, you rebound, you confess, you rebound, confess, you rebound, and you're just stumbling through the Christian way of life. That is spiritually lame. They couldn't offer the sacrifice because, because they had 
a bad leg, a bad foot, a bad knee, whatever. Spiritually ignorant. This is lacking discernment. You lack discernment. If you're spiritually ignorant, you don't see and understand what's going on. You don't know how to, uh, to analyze. You don't know how to perceive what is taking place. You lack the ability to understand and, cont and, and, um, and actually um, uh, discuss and tell what's going on in contemporary history. You lack discernment. How about this uh, spiritual uh, difficulty? Spiritually unreliable. That means misplaced confidence. You're putting your confidence in Billy Bob. You're putting your confidence in this pastor. Your uh, pastor. You're putting your confidence in this denomination or that denomination. You're putting your confidence in something else out here, and your confidence is misplaced because it needs to be in Bible doctrine, being taught by a pastor teacher, teaching by the ICE method, with a biblical worldview, so that you will be reliable in what you say, what you do, and how you live your Christian way of life. Spiritually unbalanced. That means you're not living in the spirit, in the sphere of the, uh, the spirit, the sphere of the spirit. And what does that mean? This is an emphasis of certain truths to the exclusion of others. Well, uh, let's talk about, uh, how about baptism being required for, uh, for salvation? That's not true, that's evil. That's a distortion of truth. Your life is unbalanced spiritually. You think that tithing is spiritually giving. No, it isn't. Giving is by grace. No strings attached. Your life is spiritually unbalanced. You're, you're, um, you're living your life, going to Bible class, you're taking in the word of God, but you fail to understand how to get, how to get in and live in the sphere of the spirit. And as a result, your spiritual life is um, in unbalanced. And that means basically, just like Dr. Vaught said, your life, when you add it up, adds up to zero, emphasized, emboldened, underlined, spiritually unbalanced. How about spiritual inability to grasp truth? That's failure to listen to the Holy Spirit. You, you, uh, you come to Bible class. It's the first thing you need to do, and that's what you're doing. You rebound and use Operation Cry to function in the sphere of the spirit so that when I teach the word of God, it comes through the ear gate, eye gate, tactically into your frame of reference on the left-hand side, into your mind. And because you're clean before the Lord, guess what? That word goes down into the, hum uh, into the human spirit where the Holy Spirit begins to teach you. This is where you grasp the truth. You don't grasp the truth by coming to Bible class. You find out what the truth is. But you don't live your Christian way of life based on what I say. You live your Christian life based on what I say that has been, been confirmed to you by the Holy Spirit. So that I may teach something on any good of occasion. You hear it. You don't understand it. You don't believe it at this point in time. But you say, listen, I at least need to give some consideration to this. So you say, okay, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I need some help in this. I'm yielding to you to give me some insight into this. It might come right then. It might come 30 minutes later. It might not come for two years because you fail to understand another truth that's going to link up with this thing you're trying to understand today. And until you get that, the Holy Spirit cannot illuminate the mind. Spiritually unable to bear burdens. You, uh, you're walking through life and you're crushed by the circumstances of life. This isn't right. This isn't right. Something else isn't right. You don't know this. You don't know this. And you got these burdens. Oh, I've got this wrong with me. I've got this. Uh, and it might be spiritual. It might be physical. It might be mental. Who knows what it is? But there's, you've got this burden in your life. And guess what? You fail to cast your burden on Jesus. We talk about body slamming. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. See, that's a, that's a Bible promise. Casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. There are two, the, uh, the word cares is in that verse two times. Casting all your cares upon him, Jesus, for he cares for you. Two words, exactly the, these words are uh, two, two times in the same verse, you have the same word. But in the Greek language, the word cares is two different Greek words. So really what it says is casting all your worries, all your worries upon him because Christ 
cares for you. He loves you. He wants you to have the best. He wants you to have the most. He wants you to live the kind of life that honors God. So we fail to, to, to really bear our own burdens. And the last one here is spiritual dwarf. You saw that up there. The dwarf, the little guy, he, he didn't grow. He can't take the food offering that's commanded and go into the into the into the temple or the synagogue and make the sacrifice because God says you can't do it because you are a spiritual dwarf. Well, how does that work out analogously? Here it is. We have many spiritual dwarfs in the Christian way of life. These are people who are born again, but never grow up spiritually and never grow to the stature that's intended by God. And that is to become a super grace believer, moving from spiritual self-esteem to spiritual autonomy to spiritual maturity, never fully grown to the intended stature. Now, what we saw then back here in Leviticus 21, 16 through 23, is several physical defects that forbade the people to make the kind of offering that God wanted the Israelites to make. But I'm saying, look, this is, listen to what Dr. Vaught said, what I've been saying for, for years. And that is, I didn't have the doctrine. I didn't know the doctrine. I didn't know to understand the Bible. I was a preacher. I was a pastor, but I had no understanding except some of the basic things until Dr. Vaught said, here's where you go, here's what you do, this is where you're going to learn how to study and how to become a pastor teacher. So in 1975, I took the big leap and left the convention and conventions and went to an independent setting so that I could do exactly what God wanted me to do. So over the years, I've grown, I've grown to whatever stature I am right now. But I understand these issues, and I want you to understand them too, and that's my responsibility to give them to you. So here's the issue. Physical defects from the Israelites forbade them from making certain sacrifices. In our Christian life, our spiritual defects, spiritual blindness, spiritually lame, spiritually ignorant, spiritually unreliable, spiritually unbalanced, spiritual inability to grasp the truth, spiritually unable to bear our burdens, spiritual dwarf. Now, there are some passages of scripture here that are linked to these eight, uh, eight problems in our spiritual lives. Listen to what Proverbs said. Proverbs says, where there is no vision, see you're blind. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But, conjunction of contrast, here you have no vision and you look out at your life and you're going here and there and here and there and someplace else. You have, you have no direction in your life. But he says, happy is the one who keeps the law. Let's, let's apply that to the body of Christ. Happy are you who obey the commands of God. Proverbs 25, 15 says, like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot. Oh, you got a bad tooth. Oh, it hurts so bad. Oh, I've got this unsteady foot. I, I tripped over there the other day and sort of twisted my foot, and now I can't walk straight. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a treacherous person in time of trouble. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a treacherous, see, confidence in a treacherous person in a time of trouble. So here it is, you're, you're living your Christian way of life, and where do you put your confidence? You put your confidence in a treacherous person in a time of trouble, you go over, you've got a problem in your life, you're seeking truth, you go over here, you go to the wrong person. You're putting your confidence, your confidence in a treacherous person, a person who's going to lead you astray or keep you out there in stratum, if you could put it that way, and Having confidence in a treacherous person in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. An unsteady foot. You're having trouble walking because your foot hurts. How about Hebrews 2.1? For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. Why? So that we do not drift away from it. What is it? It is truth. It's God's plan for your life. So for this reason, we must pay, we must pay much attention closer attention. So, okay, you come to Bible class, you're sort of sleepy, you're sort of this, you had a bad night, you go, you, you work too hard. What, what is it going on? What's happening in our lives? 
So pay, uh oh, just a second. Clock just, clock just went off. I need to, need to change the tape here. Hang on just a moment. Okay. Give me just a moment. Okay. All right. Back here. Back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. In other words, when you come to Bible class, you need to think. You need to, you need to be, be desirous, hungry for the truth. It's not just coming to Bible class. That's religion. But I want, Father, I want the truth with humility. I want everything that you have for me. I want to be the kind of example to you, for, uh, for you to the people I come in contact with day in and day out. I want that more than anything in my life, Father. It's not just a, a half a job. It's not 90%. It's entirely sold out to Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. Living from this, uh, living in the sphere of the spirit. So for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Are you hearing anything? Listen, the congregation at Emmanuel Baptist Church, of all that that great size of of a, a of a, a church at that point in time, there were so few listening. When I began to teach Bible doctrine. In the church that I was pastoring, when when Doctor Vaught shared with me the direction I needed to go, I was turned off by so many people; it was unbelievable. The church grew really. The church grew from like three hundred and eighty people in in on the church rolls, a huge number of people in Sunday school class in three years. It went from that to 85. So I said it really grew. It grew in reverse. Why? Because people did not want the truth. And that's why he said back here. And this, we're not just lambasting this denomination. It's true whether it's a Methodist, whether it's a, a, a Catholic, an independent church, a Methodist church, an Episcopal church, a Lutheran church. They're all out there in the same deal. So he said uh, here again. He said uh, these these people are uh, with with faith no no uh, no no object for their faith. He said these people are operationally dead. And he said I dedicate this to Southern Baptists, for we have so many millions of exactly this type people who are operationally dead, going to church, going to church, but have no clue about the spiritual way of life. Luke 9, 44 says, as for you, let these words sink into your ears. Whew, how about that? See, I indicate, sometimes I indicate that when the word of God is taught, what happens is it goes through the ear gate, hits the temp tympanic membrane, and bounces straight out, straight back out the ear. Or better still, it goes through this ear and out the other one. It doesn't lodge in the brain. So as for you, he says, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be handed over to man. In other words, at this point in time, Jesus is walking on planet Earth. He's ministering, headed for the cross. These people don't understand what's going on, and they're being told at this point, look, we're going to tell you what's going to happen out here, and you need to realize that Jesus is going to have to die, be buried, resurrected on the third day. None of you seem to be believing this. So let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be handed over to man, and he's going to be crucified, dead, and buried. And there's your Jesus, gone. You think it's all over, but three days later, he's coming out of the grave, ascending into heaven 40, 40 days later, seated at the right hand of God the Father, is, has the, um, the tactical victory of the angelic complex. See, he won the he won the strategic victory on the cross. He won the tactical victory when he was seated at the right hand of God the Father. You and I are down here on planet Earth, and we are carrying out the tactical victory down here, but we have the strategic victory 
because we are seated in Christ at the right hand of God the Father. Now that may be a lot to, a lot to, to, uh, to digest in just a moment of time. We've said that before, but these are the kind of things that we need to understand about what the Christian way of life is really all about. Otherwise, it's a religious way of life. Your faith is worthless. It, it, it adds up to zero, and it'll be a, a, day, a, a day of shame at the Bema seat. And the passion with, with, with which I say this to you today is because I grieve for the multitude of people out here, wherever they are, who are just failing to get it. I told somebody the other day regarding our, congreg our co my congregation here, those who s assemble under my leadership. I told that gentleman at that point in time, who is a man of prominence in the Christian way of life, a man of prominence. I said, listen, my people get it. My people don't need to repent. Our people need to continue to grow. Our people get it. But the world out here, the uh, Christianity in the United States needs to repent. They need to change their mind. It's not walking the aisle, raising your hand, flopping on the floor. It's changing your mind about what the Christian way of life is really all about. It's a spiritual way of life, not a religious way of life. Psalm 55, 55 22 says, cast, remember, you, we've, we, we have this spiritual inability to carry our burdens. He says, cast your burden upon the Lord. And what? And he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous, that you, as a born-again Christian, this is an application from, from the Old Testament, you are the righteous person. You are saved. He's never going to allow you to be shaken. He's not going to allow you to stumble. He's going to you're going to cast your burden on him, whatever the problem is, and you're going to take the word of God, his grace provision, and you're going to look ahead and be stable in your life. Ephesians 4.14 says, as a result, we're no longer to be children. See, you're born again as a babe. And here it is 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, 50 years later, you're still banging around in babyhood. You're still going to the same old denominational church. You're still hearing the same old message from the 15th pastor who pastored your church, whatever. You've jumped from that church to this. When you've gone over there, nothing seems to be working. Why? It's because we haven't learned what the Christian way of life is really all about. It's a spiritual way of life. It must it, it must. It must revolve around the intake and the application of the word of God from the sphere of the spirit, growing from babyhood to maximum spiritual maturity. It's a process. So he says in Ephesians 4.14, as a result, we're no longer children. What happens, to, what happens to babes in Christ? The wind blows here, the wind blows there, the wave comes here, the wave goes there, and just tossed here and there and there, and tossed all over the place. There's no stability. We are no longer to be children. You start out as a, ch a child of God, born again. And you're not a child of God. You're not in the family of God until you are born again. And that's why believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Eternal salvation. You couldn't lose it if you wanted to. But he says, look, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Somebody comes up and says, whoa, no, this is, the, this is the truth. No, that's the truth. No, something else. And he says, by the trickery of people, the craftiness in deceitful scheming. Good gracious. When you take a look, when you take a look at the, the spiritual way of life, when you take a look at the five laws of divine establishment and see how the five laws of, of uh, divine establishment, freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, wow. Did you see the did you see the uh, uh, the the rally down in Texas last night? Did you see the multitudes of patriots that were there? But the truth of the matter is it's not just establishment, it's the spiritual way of life attached to that that's going to make this country strong. And by the way, we can we can get the establishment principles all right, but if there's no spiritual life, God's looking down, and this is why you're going to get a tornado somewhere. This is why you're going to get a mudslide. This is why you're going to get a flood. This is why you're going to get a plane crash. This is why you're going to get this. God is trying to get the attention of we the people. 
As a result, we're no longer children tossed to and fro, here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by, by the trickery of people. Oh boy, you can't believe how spiritual our church is. We got a bus ministry now. We got a January Bible study. We've got uh, we got a, a children's a children's church. We're we're, we're gonna we're gonna sing modern modern hymns. Get rid of those old things. By craftiness and deceitful scheming. Point three here. We're talking about the Christian rule. And what is the Christian rule? Let's go back up there and get it again. Here's the Christian rule. To consider another as more important than yourselves. See, that's humility. Humility. So until we take that on, we got a problem in our life. So that rule, this Christian rule, strikes a blow at all worldly ambition. Well, the question is, what is worldly ambition? See, you may be a you may be a born-again Christian, but you have all this these worldly ambition. You want to be the best of this. You want to be the best of that. You want this. You want that. I want something else down here. Oh, it's my ambition to be a baseball player. Oh, it's my ambition to become an, uh, become an attorney at law so I can be uh, part of the FBI. Oh, it's my desire to be a pastor teacher, to be the pastor of this great humongous Baptist church with a thousand people and a million dollar budget so I can do this and do that. Hold it just a moment. What is it? Look at your own life. This Christian rule strikes a blow at all worldly ambition. And what is worldly ambition? Worldly ambition is ambition pursued while functioning in the sphere of the flesh. You're under the influence of your old sin nature. So that even if you achieve what your goal is, it's a worldly ambition because you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit. And the truth of the matter is when you get to the Bema seat, it's zero, it is worthless. And then you have to live with that through all of eternity. Now, when you're living in that all eternity, the, the, the last major, major blow in your life is at the Bema seat. And you realize what you could have been but weren't, what you have lost, but not what you could have gained. And from there on out, it's smooth flowing. But we have that one last jar at the Bema seat based upon worldly ambition. So the Christian rule, the same Christian world, what does it do? It produces universal contentment in any low condition of life. Listen, this is absolutely this is absolutely amazing. And to me, when I teach this this morning, I know it's gonna be misunderstood. It's gonna be misunderstood by a multitude of people out here and it has nothing to do with race. It's just that it will be under, it will misunderstood by people out here who don't have a biblical worldview. Well, what is this thing that's going to upset some people? This Christian rule of making yourself to where you you see yourself as as um, one who is not going to one up somebody. Everybody else is more important than you. You say that's impossible. No, that's God's rule. So this Christian rule produces universal contentment, it, universal contentment in any low condition of life into which low condition, this low condition, the providence of God has assigned you. Let's suppose for a moment, you're looking at your own life and said, I can't believe that, I'm, that God put me here. Here you are in this condition of life, whatever it happens to be, and you see yourself as worthless, you see yourself as no value. You see yourself as, oh, what am I going to do? So what happens is God has placed you by divine providence. His will, his sovereign will has placed you in the condition that you are in now. Only to find out that there can be universal contentment in that low condition of life. But the question is, how are you handling it? In 1 Corinthians uh, seven, beginning in verse 17. Here's what it says. And it's concerning this low condition in life where God has placed you, okay? First Corinthians seven seventeen says, nevertheless, and that word nevertheless in the Greek is actually the word if in the first class condition. So if and it's true, well, what's true? Nevertheless, as the Lord has assigned 
to each one. Now watch that, watch that. Nevertheless, as the Lord has assigned to each one. Okay, so you're a born again Christian and God has assigned something to you in eternity past so that when you look at the condition of your life right now, you are exactly where God wants you. So nevertheless, as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each person, so must he or she, you the person, so must you live. He said, I give, the, he said, I give this sort of direction in all the churches. Let each one remain in that situation in life in which he or she was called. Whoa, hold on. What did he say and what did he mean? Nevertheless, first class condition, if and it's true, the Lord has assigned to you, to me, to each one of us, the Lord has assigned to each one of us a particular status in life. That is the status that you are in right now. It's the low condition, the condition that you see yourself living in. Oh, I wish it were better than that. I'm down here in the bottom, oh gee. No, the Lord has assigned you that that particular status in life. As he has called each one, so he has assigned a status to the person he has called. Who is the person that's called? That's the person that has been invited into the, into the Christian way of life through the door of salvation by means of the gospel. So God, the word of God is preached to you. The gospel is preached to you. You believe it. God has called you into the Christian way of life. And as you enter the Christian way of life, you had a status that was assigned to you by God the Father. And the question is, what are you going to do in that status? So he must, so, so must he, the person who is called, that you who are saved, you must live in the status assigned to you by God. What is your status? Whatever that status is, God has assigned that status to you to live there in that status to give honor and glory to him. This is why when we talk, when I talk with Al about marriage, it's a test. People don't see marriage as a test. Oh, yes, it's a test. But they don't realize that it's a test for the betterment of your spiritual life by using the, the plan of God the logistical grace provision that he has for you to overcome that circumstance that's giving you trouble. So Paul says, I give this sort of direction in all the churches. What does he say to them? He said, I'm talking to you who are saved, and I want you to look at your condition, the condition you came into the Christian way of life with. And he said, I'm telling every church and every person where I go in my ministry, I'm telling them, you need to live in that condition you need to remain in that condition and the condition is that low condition of your life okay so he says i give this sort of direction in all the churches now he goes on to say then and this is like poking at you he said that each one remain in that situation in life What's the situation? It's the status provided by God that you entered into the Christian way of life with, that low status in your life, but you see in which he was called, he or she was called. Now, let me point out something here. And what I'm about to say here is related to this verse 17, but it's going, it's going, to, uh, it's, it's going to move forward and actually apply to what Paul's going to begin to say in verse 21. And following. So knowing that you've been called into the Christian way of life, you see yourself in a low status. You can't believe that God would do that to you, only to find out that Paul says, look, you were saved in this condition. God wants you to stay right there. Now, what he's going to do, he's going to use, he's going to use an illustration of slavery. And amazing. So he says, no one is sure how many slaves lived in the Roman society. Because see, Paul's Paul's talking to a group of people here. And uh, we need to realize that throughout the Roman Empire at this point in time, slavery was a big deal. But no one is sure how many slaves lived in the Roman society. One estimate says that about 20% of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves around 100 BCE. That's before the Christian era. That's before 1 AD, okay? Now, that's, that's before the birth of Christ. Now, 
Paul is Paul is living later than that. Paul's up into the 50s and the 60s AD, okay? But the, the Roman Empire was known for its slavery. So we're not talking about slavery in America. We're not talking about slavery in Africa. We're not talking about slavery in China. We're not talking about slavery somewhere else. We're talking about slavery in general. So he says, no one knows what, no, no one knows for sure how, uh, how many slaves lived in the Roman society. One estimate said about 20% of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves around 100 BC. Slavery in ancient Rome differed from its, uh, it differed from its modern forms in that it was, it was not based on race. Now listen to what I just said. Slavery in the ancient Rome, that empire, did, it differed from its modern forms in that back then, slavery was not based on race. But like modern slavery, it was abusive and degrading institution. Cruelty was commonplace. Now, what we're going to get after verse 17, leading up to verse 21, Paul is going to give you an illustration of what he was saying back here in verse 17. And what did he say in verse 17? He said, nevertheless, if, and it's true, as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each person, so must he live, she live, I give this sort of direction to, in all the churches. Let each one remain in that situation in life in which he was called. Now, verse 21 says this, were you called, that means into salvation, were you called as a slave? In other words, your, your, your condition at salvation was a slave. It was slavery. He said, do not worry about it. Do not worry about it. You are, you're, you're a born again Christian. And a moment, a, a moment you became a born again Christian, you were, uh, you were in slavery. And Paul said, wait a minute, don't worry about it. You say, I don't want to live in this low condition of life. He says, don't worry about it. But if indeed you are able to be free, make the most of the opportunity. Now, this doesn't mean break loose. This doesn't mean break out of jail. No, no, that's not. Go over the fence. This means if you're able to get out of, out of slavery legitimately, take the opportunity. Now, watch this. Things that we can learn from verse 22, or 21. First of all, the person he's talking about, he said, I wasn't saved and now I'm saved. See, this, this was someone who was called into, into Christianity. He, was give, he or she was given the gospel. So they were called into Christianity. It just so happens that when they were called, they were a slave. So he said, I wasn't saved and now I am saved. He says, I was a slave and I am still a slave. See, that's what the verse is telling us. Slavery was one of the, one of the greatest evils in the Roman empire. Yet Paul does not address the evils of slavery. He talks about slavery. He knows that there was an abuse of slaves. He knows, he knows that it was evil. But Paul does not address slavery to tell people how to get out of slavery. What he's going to do is Paul is going to address doctrinal issues whereby people in all situations in life may remain in that situation and glorify God. There it is. Remain in that situation and glorify God. So, for example, the marriage, got all these problems in marriage. The answer is not divorce. The answer is finding the truth in the word of God, becoming humble in mind, and letting the word of God give you strength and power to work through the circumstances of your life to be able to be strengthened to go on to glorify him. See, Paul did not preach, as do, do many denominations today, he did not preach a social gospel that's getting along together. Would it, would it uh, offend you? Would it uh, surprise you to find out that in our public schools, I can take you back a hundred or so years and show you that the evidence was at that point in time that you stop teaching reading, stop teaching math, and stop teaching people to, uh, to um, uh, okay, to, to read and to do math. Don't do that, especially don't teach children to read. The issue in, in our school system should be a social, a social kind of thing, uh, um, enabling the races to get along better to, uh, with each other. See, that was, the, that was an objective in education, and I can show you evidence of that. Over 100 years ago, this is where the cancer began to invade, and a little, little at a time, it's gone, grown to where it is today. 
So Paul did not preach a social gospel. He didn't try to get rid of slavery. Paul asked, are you a slave? He said, don't worry about it. See, you have to, you have to come to the idea of what is the Christian way of life all about? The meaning of don't worry, what does that mean? It means don't become upset because you are a slave. And you might say to me, well, it's easy for a person who wasn't a slave or your ancestors weren't slaves. Excuse me, I can't help that. I am what I am, I am who I am because of what God made me. My desire now and my responsibility is to teach the truth. So point nine said, if you are able to become free, take advantage of the opportunity. And if you are freed, use your freedom to glorify God. If you're not freed, use your slavery to glorify God. Whatever your status is in life, remain that way. Is that clear? Now, verse 22. Verse 22 says, for the one who is called into your spiritual salvation, you're saved. God gave you the gospel. You believed it. So for the one who is called in the, in the Lord as a slave, and that means the temporal status at the time of salvation. This is, your, this is the status you are while you're alive on planet Earth. So the one who is called in the Lord as a slave, what is he going to do? Is the Lord's freed man. What that means is you may be a slave as far as the temporal world is concerned, but your spiritual status while remaining a temporal slave is a spiritual freed man. In the same way, the same way as one was called as a slave, in the same way, the one who was called as a free person, that means you, you were a free person, you were not a slave, you were a free person, and the gospel was given to you and you became a born again Christian. Now you were called as a free person. You were free when you, when you received the gospel. Guess what? The one who was called as a free person is now Christ's slave. So what do we learn from verse 22? You serve the Lord even when you're a slave. Secondly, every believer is in full-time Christian service, whether he or she is a slave or free. Whatever your social status might be, you are to serve the Lord. Whatever your social status might be, you are to serve the Lord. And here's the point. Serve the Lord no matter what your status may be, free or slave. Verse 23 says, you, the slave man, the slave and the free man, you, the slave or the free man, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. In whatever situation, at your temporal status, whatever situation someone was called, brothers and sisters, were you a slave or were you free when you became a born again Christian? Let him, let him, the new believer, male or female, remain in it, your temporal status with God. Now, what do we learn from verse 23? Here we have a change in the believer's perspective. Why are you in full-time Christian service? See, why are you in full-time Christian service? And the answer is you are bought with a price. The slave is bought with a price. The free man is bought with a price. The price paid to buy you was Christ's work on the cross. Someone had to pay. And Christ did all the paying. First, first Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Those who are really saved are really in the Lord's, in Lord's service. Every believer is in full-time Christian service. You do not have to change your status from social slavery to social freedom to be in full-time Christian service. When you accept Christ as your savior, and you did, you're never the servant of man. That means do not allow yourself to be influenced by human viewpoint. Do not let the viewpoint of mankind hinder your service. And in verse 24, we have a change in the believer's perspective intended to accompany your salvation. So whether you're free or whether you're a slave, when you become a born again Christian, verse 24 is to give you a change of perspective, perspective about your life that accompanies your salvation. He says, remain in the situation in which you were called. And that is not a unique rule just for the Corinthians. In fact, this rule is the universal rule which Paul taught in every Christian assembly. Why would Paul teach this in every Christian assembly wherever he went? And here's the reason why Paul taught this. It is not improbable then and even today that there were occasions when those people who became born again Christians while living in a lowly status such as slavery might suppose 
that Christianity dissolved them of their former status in life. But the answer to that question is, if a question is raised, did, did that dissolve my status as a free man or a slave? The answer is no. We serve the Lord in whatever status we are called. Now, I have uh, verse 4 down here. You don't have it in your notes. That's where we pick up this coming Wednesday and move on from here. We're going on to verse, uh, into verse 4 and then verse 5. Father, thank you this morning for this, this passage of Scripture. Yes, it's tough. I understand that. But if we're going to have a biblical worldview about freedom and slavery, we have to understand what your issue is. What is the truth about this? So whether freed or slave, we're to remain in the, in the condition, the status of life that we were called. Yes, if the opportunity avails itself to get out of, out of slavery, yes, he said, take advantage of that. But the issue is your plan, your plan for human life to resolve the spiritual battle known as the angelic conflict. Father, all I can say this morning is thank you for this, for this passage of scripture. Thank you for the word and thank you for the privilege of being able, I believe in humility, to teach this passage to our people. Thank you, Father, in Christ's name, amen. Folks, we'll be back this coming, this coming uh, Sunday uh, Wednesday, rather. I'm let me turn this off. Okay. We'll be back in this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and we'll be picking up here with verse 4 and moving on. God bless you all. Have a great day.